thank you to today's Frontier Opening Bell. I am hosting the Mofaye. Uh, Ali Kansacho in Nairobi, Rich Frontiers Management CEO. Wally Olusi from United Capital, Head Investment Research. Joshua Odebisi from Betima Capital, the Banking Analyst. And Ayodi Jebo, who is the CEO at Afrin Invest Securities. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Morning. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you. Let's uh, just take a quick look at the uh, where we finished off on Thursday. Today's final trading day for many of the African markets. A bit of a, a negative reading. The uh, stock markets in Ivory Coast and Egypt were down on um, Thursday. South African market was uh, down as well. Akeya managed 0.06%, and Nigerian market uh, a bit close to 1%, 0.83%. Uh, percent. The uh, Nigeria story has some uh, news around the ending season. We'll get to that in a couple of minutes. So let's check in with the East African markets where the Kenyan bond said that Ogada is a new secretary at the International Monetary Fund in Washington. Uh, the NCBA group, which operates both in Nigeria and in Kenya, says it's short in fronting branches in uh, Kenya to cut uh, uh, costs. Meantime, Kenya's output, T outputs, up nearly 30% in the first half of the year. Uganda saw its inflation for June 4.1%, and Ethiopia and France are signing the 20 million euros deal to finance MSMEs. Uh, Ali, how do you come in here? I think I'll I look at the uh, business news first. Okay, um, uh, well, let's start with, first of all, this appointment of Seda Ogada. Everyone's terribly excited about that here in Kenya. Um, a serious validation uh, of, of, his, uh, of, of his bona fides. NCBA Bank was a merger between uh, commercial, uh, between um, NIC Bank um, uh, and, and uh, Commercial Bank of Africa, CBA. Um, and uh, this, was, this merger happened last year. And obviously, we would have expected some branch rationalization, and branch rationalizations have been accelerated by COVID. Um, and I think this was a decision that was in the pipeline, um, uh, and it's really around uh, ripping costs out of the merger, rationalizing the number of branches, um, and uh, I think that's the context which, with which to see that uh, development. T, you know, Kenya is, is uh, like Saudi Arabia is to OPEC. Kenya is to the tea markets. Um, and uh, this is quite a surge, 28.5% uh, up in terms of production. We've had pretty soft tea prices, I've got to say. It's been overall quite disappointing. But that's also a function of the supply de demand dynamic. Whenever we supply, excessive tea into the markets, prices tend to correct pretty quickly. And some of our big mark source, some of our big buyers are like Pakistan, and they've had their own, Iran is a buyer, they've had their own challenges, and I think that's led to price weakness, but pretty substantial. It's, it's one of our pillars of the economy, worth more than a billion dollars a year um, in income. So, you know, very material. Uganda inflation, 4.1%. I would have expected it to be lower. Uganda has extremely good agriculture. They're one country who don't have a food production problem. You know, the FAO last week was worrying about food markets and food prices. But uh, I would have expected Ugandan inflation to be a bit lower than that. But uh, I think that's coming through. And then this Ethiopia situation, $20 million. Look, I mean, you know, Ethiopia has had its, some serious challenges in the last few weeks. You've had the internet lockdown. Um, they are actually the one country in Sub-Saharan Africa which tends to lock down the internet the highest of any uh, Sub-Saharan African country. Um, reports coming out of, uh, from the ground show that there was... Uh, a lot of property damage, um, in particularly Oromia State, which is uh, where the singer who was assassinated came from. Um, the IMF and the World Bank have Ethiopia growing 2.1% or thereabouts this year. That's a Hail Mary pass. It will be negative GDP, I'm afraid. 
And then you've got the final situation, um, a lot of debate as to whether they're filling the dam, this GERD dam, which they finance via diaspora money. Um, they are, the Sudanese are saying they're filling it, they're saying the water flow is less. The Ethiopians are saying, no, no, it's just the rain. Yeah, the Ethiopian says the story, that story was incorrect, that they were filling the dam. Yes. But we'll see how it goes. Uh, inflation is a big story. Thank you, Ali. Um, Nigeria's inflation came in this morning, 12.5%. Wally Odissi will speak to us more about the United Capital earnings. Uh, but a couple of other stories around Nigeria, the Investment Promises Report, which was released yesterday for Q2 and half year by NIPC, President Buhari's administration is going for gold. But let's talk about this a bit, uh, uh, in a, uh, a bit later. Let's quickly run down through the inflation uh, numbers. What do you make of it, uh, my uh, panelists from Nigeria? Let's start with you, Valio Lucy. What's your take on this inflation data, quickly? Oh, okay. Uh, thanks, um, Boston, for having me. Uh, inflation has come to about 12.5 now in Nigeria for the month of June. And uh, for us, it's not surprising. Our expectation is that you know, that trajectory is expected to continue for, you know, most of the year. And some of the drivers that we've seen as at the month of June, you know, clearly will include, you know, hiking food prices on the back of the restriction on movement and, you know, border closure earlier in the year and so many other pressure that COVID-19 has created in the system. By the way, don't forget that, you know, we also kind of adjust the currency, um, you know, um, the president actually reversed the price of um, petroleum back to 145 or 143, you know, earlier it was more or less moderated to 125. So we think this pressure will continue for the rest of the year. We don't expect a huge spike, but we think it will continue to creep our expectation is about you know 13 percent by the end of of the year which would make the annual average well above where we landed as at 2019 where it was averaging 11 point something so for mm -hmm. us there is no surprise at all in the numbers let me okay let me quickly ask uh i heard it here from my friend best in 30 seconds what's your take on this inflation report Yes, uh, I think it is, is in line with expectation. Um, the pressure points are very obvious. Uh, would the, but looking at the core inflation, uh, still on a month-on-month -month basis at 0 0.8, uh, it still looks a bit surprising uh, because if we look at in the last two months, um, if you look at the FX market, uh, most of the transactions have been done through the parallel markets, uh, through the unofficial window. And we feel that um, we, that should have um, begun to impact on prices uh, because we import a lot and uh, we, we feel that uh, that month on month increase should be more than that for, uh, based on our own projection for the month of June for core inflation, which should have further pressured um, the headline inflation. Uh, but um, maybe, yeah, there's also there's a time lag between when um, um, they, we Im import and when uh, we begin to uh, we s begin to see prices of uh, prices uh, reflect those um, increases, especially the FX rate. But uh, by and large, we it's going to we expect that that would like where Wally had just um, said uh, it's also is going to increase on a month on month. Uh, basis towards the end of the year, especially from also the food, um, food uh, sub-index. Thank you. Joshua, uh, or WC at Vetiva, what's your take at Vetiva uh, on this 12.5% uh, headline inflation figure? Well, just quickly, the thing is, when we look at the um, policies from the Central Bank of Nigeria, we can see that this is, you know, this is to be expected due to the fact that there's pretty significant, you know, constraint on foreign, foreign exchange liquidity right now. And obviously that would continue to pressure food prices because of the fact that Nigeria continues to import the majority of our um, food. Now, even restricting access to FX and, you know, pushing most of these importers to the 
black market is going to have a significant impact on food price and adding maize to, to that to that list of restricted um, commodities that we can no longer get you know legitimate FX for is just going to really ramp up the price because Nigeria does not produce nearly enough um, maize to cover the, the local demand and the industrial demand. And that's what people forget is that there's a significant industrial demand due to the fact that it is a um, a pretty essential stock feed. So obviously this is going to have significant pressures going forward and we can only see it going up like all the other analysts have said. Uh, thank you, folks, uh, talking about Nigeria's inflation. Let's talk about the Southern African markets. Uche Naminis is joining us from Blue FX Nigeria. So let's look at the SA market. FDI inflows into, Southern, into South Africa, $1.7 billion in first quarter. Producer inflation up 0.4% in April. Investec Bank is listing about 200 million rand senior unsecured credit linked bond uh, papers today. Amplats, that's American Platinum, reporting a massive 41% drop in, in platinum production uh, in, in, the, in, in earlier in the year. And Zimbabwe's economy will contract 4.5% on virals and droughts. They've gotten some money uh, in, to, to help mitigate that. Let me start this, uh, bringing uh, uh, Uche and Amini quickly into the conversation. Uche, so where's the currency play here? It looks like the rand, the South African rand, seem to have uh, outplayed some uh, guys, some folks who, <laughs> some traders who want to hedge against it. What's this? What are we learning this morning to start this Friday as we wrap up the week? Um, what we can see in the African round, as I normally would mention, is sort of um, a positive sort of risk on sentiment as we're seeing in the global market space. Um, South Africa economy sort of serves as an anchor from the, um, should I say, margin financial market space on the African continent when we are lacking to see a bit of optimism in the global market horizon. And that's what we're seeing in the run. Um, that is still what is still being priced into the market right now. There is the general over, over belief that um, central bank policies and government uh, physical policies will be enough to um, avert any possible downtime, um, should I say, economic, uh, um, should I say, recession. Uh, People are starting to price in the possibility that there might be a second wave and a close down in economies, but that in itself, um, 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 government authorities have come out to say there might not be a total shutdown going forward. That things are starting to normalize. So there is that there is that place whereby we are coming from a subpar um, zero level when it comes to demand, and now we are in a place where we are just picking up demand because some economies have need and use for one of the or two of the commodities and consumption going forward. So that's what we are seeing um, trickling into the uh, uh, economy. Uh, thank you, Ali. The, 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 let's talk a bit about mining for about two minutes. The numbers are coming through from some of the big miners, Anglo-American, uh, 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 American Platinum reporting 41% decline. Gold, uh, sorry, diamond, I beg your pardon, diamond, uh, 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 makers had a very rough year. Uh, one uh, uh, report says they were closing up this year because the handy mix sales looks like nobody's buying diamonds, even though diamonds are still there. Uh, what's your take on, on the mining and uh, these uh, resources prices so far that we are now seeing the numbers coming through in terms of production and in terms of how that impacts on their balance sheet? So, so, so let me start with uh, just separating out the issue of diamonds. Diamonds, I see as uh, a separate niche in the uh, in this space. I think that's highly correlated to well-being, consumer sentiment, spending power, and I think all of those have been hit quite hard. You know, you, you, people are, are struggling to make a living. Uh, they're not going to go and typically splash out on diamonds at this point in time. A lot of weddings, obviously, weddings are seen as a petri dish of disease propagation. So you've seen a massive reduction in the number of weddings, big weddings, and so forth. Um, going to the issue of platinum, the, the, the report you carried of a 41% reduction in stock, actually, this is happening all over the place. This is why copper prices have jumped 20% in the last four weeks. It's because of production worries out of Chile. So what we're seeing also uh, uh, is a lot of minds, I think, have been very cautious about telling 
us what's really going on. But there's a massive issue around production, whether it's platinum, whether it's gold. I saw a report yes, yesterday that the demand for gold out of the Congo, for example, is sky high. There's a ton of gold shifting through its neighbors um, because of this demand. So I, I'm seeing production drop off. I think that's what's supporting the prices of a lot of these mining companies at the moment. And I think in many cases, they're in a sweet spot. I'm bullish about gold, I'm bullish about silver. Copper, I think, has got a little bit ahead of itself because of its correlation with the real economy. And I don't think the real economy is going to rebound to the extent the copper price is informing us. Zimbabwe, just to touch on that final headline you had, minus 4.5% contraction. This is Methulian Cube speaking to Parliament yesterday. Um, he was saying exports are holding up, but otherwise, I mean, you're, you're really in a, a monetary policy experiment in Zimbabwe today. The currency has collapsed, the stock market is shut, and, and really, uh, for, for until now, we haven't seen enough international support to change the nature of the game over there. Mm. Uh, interesting, the outlook from uh, uh, on inflation for, for Zimbabwe. Well, but again, let's quickly go back to Nigeria. Thank you so much, Ali. We'll touch on North Africa just before we wrap up the show. Wale uh, from United Capital, I want you to talk to your uh, earnings that which came out yesterday. Uh, the headline, the bottom line, the total asset numbers look really good. How did you achieve this? <laughs> Well, well, thank you for the question, Bosin. I mean, if you look through the balance sheet I item, I think a few things will be obvious there. You will see the jump in um, total assets, uh, total liabilities, uh, total managed funds. All of those numbers actually jumped a lot. Now, uh, our euro bond fund, our money market fund, bond fund, all those mutual funds, those funds are one of the fastest growing in the last 18 months in the country. Um, and, you know, because of the environment, you might want to argue that, you know, our spread income might be pressured. I mean, how much is Treasury bills doing and all that? But I think the fee or mutual fund, if it's growing that fast, is significant. So, you know, that accounts for what's happening to, you know, the sharp jump in revenue growth. Don't also forget that last year was a little bit of a... Um, a challenging year for Nigeria uh, in terms of election, so it was challenging for us actually. So there's also a little base effect there. But then, if you break down the business into you know uh, our different subsidiaries, earlier in the year, remember our investment banking business, you know, did very well in terms of supporting the Lagos State Bond, um, the Dangote. And, you know, and a few other, you know, key transactions that have made headline. We also raised um, a, a bond and as well as a CP this year, you know, and then we've been able to, you know, find a way to do, you know, to, to deploy those balance sheets. You know, these are some of the things that drove performance for the investment banking business. Given the low yield environment that we have, a lot of corporates are coming into the market. The trustee business is also supporting many of these um, debt offerings. And like I already mentioned, the asset management is also doing well. Um, we've been able to rationalize costs for our stockbroking business. And then they've also been able to do some placements. Um, if you go through you know, our annual report, you see that we've also incubated consumer finance business earlier in the year, which is also doing very well considering the low yield environment. And the fact that with recession, you need a lot of consumer loans here and there. So put all of this together, I think those are some of the things driving that number. Interesting. Let me ask your colleague. Uh, you have two colleagues here, Joshua and I. So I'm sure they must be uh, looking at, uh, at what you said and the numbers out yesterday. I you, let me ask you, how is the market in terms of managed funds so far this year? I'm sure you folks at Africans have a couple of it. Yes. Um, as rightly <clears throat> mentioned by Wale, we've seen that um, shift uh, because you see when you look at the fixed income markets, but especially at the shorter end of the curve, the yields have declined significantly. So for most even investors going on their own to invest, um, there's really no incentive. So mutual funds have been able to benefit from this. And 
um, rightly me mentioned the dollar fund of the uh, anxiety and the expectation of that devaluation, which we're already seeing now. We saw um, even at Afri Invest a lot of interest in the, the dollar funds and uh, because of the expectation that there will be a devaluation or depreciation of the Naira. So for fund managers, I, I believe that this um, low yield environment pro provide um, a very good opportunity for them to also be very innovative. Structured products is what I feel uh, for most people for United Capital we should see because they we also they also have the name there. Structured products within the real sector, the agri space, the real estate space, um, project based projects, uh, and because of the um, huge expected maturity, which is still about five to six trillion before the end of the year, I believe uh, the PFAs would also be happy to partake from this. When you check the proportion of their investments in infrastructure fund, it's still less than one percent. So I believe uh, for fund managers, if they are also able to um, engineers and come up with more structured products based on their experience, because they have the different investment banking space that can help craft the projects and, and support that project, and they can raise funding, and the asset management can raise funding to support this project. I believe that um, it's a good, it's a good uh, time and opportunity for most of the uh, fund managers now. Great. Uh, Joshua, how are you folks doing in Adventiva Capital? Well, I think the easy, best thing I can say is that in this current environment, there are a lot of opportunities across the very, um, various business units for growth and expansion and really to, to, to enter new markets and just to really diversify the businesses because obviously, you know, the status quo is has been shown to, to be a bit weak and, you know, in order to continue to survive in this climate is very important to innovate and I think that that's what we have been doing. Uh, our own mutual funds have also been growing significantly, and we've also been on some very important transactions as well. And I think that what this shows us is that investors are not you know, sitting on their hunches. They're all looking for opportunities to continue to invest and to continue to you know, make profit. And we are certainly driving the push to, to continue to deliver value to investors. Yes, of course, when I saw Axela, for example, doing 11.6 billion Naira SPV uh, on, on the stock exchange, I knew you guys have your fingerprints all over it, uh, all your big names. So I'm sure you folks have some chunk of that money uh, as fees. So I uh, envy you guys there, uh, uh, Ayo, Wale, and, and, and Vativa. You guys, you guys are having a nice time. I look at the reports of the stock exchange for the first six months of this year, and there hasn't been one single letdown despite the pandemic. The funds, the right issues are coming, and you guys are at the center of it all, even as uh, Transco and the rest are doing rights issues. So I'll just let you, which is, give us about a minute about the ECB's rate decisions yesterday. What do you think could be the way forward? The IMF yesterday revised global economic output. China will grow 1%. The rest of the world will be negative 4.9%. If we have a virus, COVID-19 2.0, what's your take, quickly? I mean, it's already a given um, this, um, the state of the global economy going forward. The uh, IMF has actually um, highlighted, and I think they've been, they've been uh, uh, compared to counterparts, they've been quite, uh, um, uh, should I say, pure with their, with their analysis. Um, um, highlighting the possible risk. A um, so couple of weeks back, they also highlighted that there is so much um, divergence between the real economy and what is happening in financial market, and that in itself is posing a fresh risk um, aside of the coronavirus. That, that has been the case. The ECB um, highlighted that they kept, kept their risks unchanged going forward. Um, um, Christian Lagarde, has, um, in a, in a um, um, statement yesterday, highlighted and emphasized that uh, they, they can see their monetary policy uh, decisions sort of kicking up in effect, um, stimulating growth in the short term, and that will be the case. I think um, it's coming to the point whereby central banks are seeing that right now, uh, the idea of assuming that the economy in itself is an ideal efficient economy, that whatever monetary uh, decision they are putting in would translate and 
trans have that ripple effect into the real economy. It's not exactly so. It's all theoretical. So they are sort of looking at possible ways to actually have some real economic growth stimulation rather than just pumping money through their yeah, um, 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 conventional or unconventional monetary policies. Uh, the Federal Reserve um, statements have been putting out um, chairmen and chair presidents of the presidents of um, Central uh, Federal Reserve Bank have been putting out that they need some more um, targeted measures to real economy and rather not just have a broad monetary policy approach to these things because it's literally not translating into the hands of the of the um, everyday person in the countries. Um, interesting how uh, this risk of risk of beginning to flip on and off almost every on a daily basis. No one is really sure when it's going on or, and off. So there's a lot of uncertainty. Let's talk about North African markets quickly, uh, and then before we, we uh, wrap up for this uh, Friday, uh, Egyptian market was down yesterday 2.36 percent. Africa gave Egypt 3.55 billion dollars for virus. But Egyptian bank deposit is also uh, rising. Let's uh, have the, uh, the final take on North Africa from Ali for just one minute. So, uh, Orson, I'll just touch on uh, the Egyptian bank deposit uh, uh, situation rising uh, substantially above uh, four and a half trillion. I think that's more a consequence of uh, this liquidity formation we're seeing in the banks because of the slowdown in our economies. Uh, across the continent. We're seeing capital build up in the banks. That capital is being typically recycled into the short end of the government yield curve in the local markets. So we've seen a substantial reduction in interest rates, whether it's in Kenya, whether it's in Nigeria. So it's quite a positive feedback loop. Um, uh, and that scenario is playing out here in Kenya with massive oversubscription in the 91-day T-bills, for example. And I think you're seeing something quite similar over in Nigeria. Just to end up with your risk-on, risk-off question, let me put this out to you. I believe we will have more than 300 million infections by December. I think the number of deaths is set to turn exponential. And therefore, I think we're now at a point uh, when the market is going to have to deal with an exogenous uncertainty that is the virus that remains unresolved. And they're going to just throw more money at the problem. We know that. But really, is it going to work? That's what the equity market is sort of looking at. And that's what the risk bond markets are looking at. Interesting, Ali. Thank you so much. We're taking the coronavirus on board. Everyone is taking it on board these days, uh, even those who talk about the diamond lifestyle and what of you. You want to stay safe and stay healthy. You're not checking into your safe deposit whether the diamond is still there. So you need a virus, or sorry, you need a vaccine, and you need a drug yet, not a diamond. So diamond can always get locked up. Thank you so much, everyone. Next week is going to be very interesting for Nigerian market. We have an MPC on Monday. The Central Bank of Nigeria confirmed last night that the MPC will be one day, and that will be July the 28th. Gentlemen, I'm sure you have that on your calendar. Then I'm sure you have the DMO uh, debt option next week also on your calendar for Nigeria. Quite a lot to talk about in the third week of July. Thank you very much while you're listening from United Capital. Joshua Davis from the Tiba Capital Management, Eric Jebo at Afrinvest Securities. Thank you very much. Which I mean is from Blue FX Nigeria. And of course, Ali Kansachi, founder CEO at Rich Frontiers Management in Nairobi. Thank you, gentlemen. Have a great weekend, and I'll see you next week.